Kia ora. Kiwi Kaja here and welcome to episode 64, The Battle of Wailrua. This follows on directly from episode 63, so go and check that out first. My references for this episode are listed in the description section below. We left episode 63 with Tarao Para and his Ngāti Toa all on Kapiti. Most of his Taranaki allies have returned home to prepare for a possible Waikato invasion. The Iwi on the mainland have sought the alliance of neighbouring Iwi to the north, south and the top of the South Island to participate in the biggest seaborne invasion ever attempted in Aotearoa. The response has been excellent. Everyone sees the Palaha as a mortal danger. It is probably late March of 1824 that this huge fleet assembles at Otaki and Waikanae. From high points on Kapiti, Te Rao Paraha sees the ever-increasing twinkle of fires on the opposite coast. His forces have strengthened their defences. Their opponents seem overwhelming in number, but they have done all they can. So let's just pause here to see if we can put some parameters onto the coming events. So, how many people are on Kapiti? Well, in Te Rao Paraha's 1822 migration from Taranaki to Horofenoa, to Heki, Tataramoa, it's estimated there were 2,500 men, women and children. With battles since, uh, then it's probably down to 2,350. Now, the Taranaki allies that came down in the Heki have returned, so the number on Kapiti is, say, around 1,850. How many of these are warriors? Let's say around 400. What sort of figures do we have for the invasion force? Percy Smith's sources say the number of canoes were around 2,000, but he feels that this is an exaggeration and puts the number at no less than 700. The number of warriors mentioned in the references is 2,000. That would give three warriors per canoe. Nah, doesn't sound right, does it? All we really have is subjective descriptions of canoes stretching from Waikanae to Kapiti, of a mass of canoes that stop the reflection of the sun off the water. Either way, it must have been a truly awe-inspiring flotilla. With so little detail on this invasion, the following account of the battle is mine, but based on information that has come down to us. With the weather looking favourable, a meeting of chiefs occurs at Tohoro Beach. Each chief and hapu have significant autonomy, but this meeting is to bring all parties into alignment with a coherent plan. There is disagreement as to whether the attack should be in the dark or at dawn. The smaller force at Otaki gives reasons for attacking in the dark. The force at Waikanae holds out for the dawn. The Tohanga divine that dawn is best. The attack will be the next morning. The meeting concludes. The journey from Otaki to Waiorua Bay on Kapiti is 16 kilometres. From Waikanae, it's 7 kilometres. With the wind coming from the southwest, those at Otaki choose their hour to leave. They will assemble off Kuru Kohatu Point and await the arrival of the Awaikanae fleet, 
then mount their attack. Heading into the wind, they allow extra time. The fleet from Otaki is strung out over a kilometre and will need time to congregate. With Kapiti silhouetted in the starlight, they make their way to 500 metres of Kuru Kohatu. They congregate the canoes, but find that they are way too early. They will have to kill time. They try and maintain silence, but canoes keep banging into each other as the swells roll past. They are rightfully worried that they will be heard. The canoes are slowly drifting southwest with the tide and wind, getting closer to the island. The flash and sound of multiple muskets from the shore is startling. The element of surprise is gone. They are out of accurate range, but one or two are struck. The fleet now has wild war in view. Fires are being lit, everyone there preparing for battle. Fires lit along the beach throw an orange light upon the bay. There is confusion in the fleet. Some canoes head for Wairua Beach, others, unsure, remain. In the flickering light, musketeers run along the north side of Wairua Bay, shooting at the inbound canoes. The race is on. Two Ngāti Toa canoes are launched and head south down the coast to seek help. As canoes arrive at Wairua Beach, a pitch battle occurs. Ngāti Toa have immediate success. The other canoes now go to their aid. As they arrive, Ngāti Toa are slowly pushed back to their prepared defensive positions on the flats at Wairua. From within their defences, they are able to keep the invaders at bay with musket fire. The beach fires disguise the fact that Wild Roar Beach has no room for any more canoes. Warriors discover this and drop their anchor stones and swim to shore, pressing their way through the jam of canoes. Most from the Otaki fleet are now ashore. Pockets of warriors rush the palisades but are repulsed. To do a frontal attack will be costly and require a greater force. The beach fires are extinguished to stop the invaders being silhouetted. A bizarre lull settles on Wairua as both sides ponder their next move. During this lull, Pokai Tara, commander of the Ngāti Toa forces at Wairua, calls out to the invaders for a temporary truce. Rangi Maireihau of Nati Appa answers in the affirmative. Both commanders need time for reinforcements to arrive. For Pukai Tara, it's for Tarao Paraha and his forces at Rangatira Point and at Taipiro to arrive. For Rangi Maireihau, it's for the rest of his fleet to land and the Waikanae fleet to arrive. The early light of dawn faintly silhouettes the Tararua Ranges. There is the occasional warrior seeking glory against the palisading with the answering musket shot, but a peace descends. Both sides prepare for the next phase. Rangi Mairehau runs east along the northern beach, heading towards Kuru Kohatu Point. From this slightly elevated position, he sees the Waikanae fleet. They are about 1,500 metres out and coming on at speed. He makes his way back along the beach. The Waikanae fleet is spread out over a kilometre. But as they approach, the front canoes slow to let those behind draw up. As they enter into Waiorua Bay, some see Rangi Mairehau and divert to land on the northern shore. Others head into the congested beach. 
In the improving light, Rangi Mairehau sees to the south a fleet of canoes coming towards them. It has to be Ngāti Toa. The tail of the Waikanae fleet enters Waiorua Bay as Tarao Paraha's canoes approach the bay. The Ngāti Toa canoes charge forth with musketeers firing into the mass of canoes and warriors trying to land on the north shore. Every ball finding an easy target. Warriors stream east along the beach towards Waiorua under the command of Rangi Mairaiho. When enough warriors are at hand, a frontal attack is launched on the palisades. It is brutal. Muskets fire. Tomahawk flash as the palisades escape. Axes and spears take their toll. Some make it over and create a defensive area. This allows more to pour over. The fighting is intense. On the water, Te Reo Paraha attacks the canoes still landing. Many abandon the landing and hove to to sea. With the landing of new warriors stopped, he turns his canoes towards the beach at Wairoa. As they come across anchored canoes, they cut them free and set them adrift. Meanwhile, the musketeers in the canoes fire on the rear of the attackers. This is unexpected, and the assault on the palisades falters. With the flow of warriors over the palisade halted, Ngāti Toa on the inside have time to gather themselves and overwhelm and kill those on the inside. They have time to reload. The sun is now just peeking over the Tararua Ranges. The invaders can now see many of their canoes floating away. Firing resumes from inside the palisade. Firing intenses from the rear. It feels like the jaws of death are closing, and their hope of safety is drifting away on the tide. As many chiefs fall, the cohesion of the various hapu falters. It takes a little while, but soon everyone realises that the tide of battle now favours the Raupara. The invaders break. Escape now their only thought. From their canoes at the beach, Tarao Paraha's warriors are clubbing and shooting the invaders as they push past bodies and canoes. Only few fight. Most push off or swim out to drifting canoes. There are too many fish for Ngāti Toa to catch this morning. The invaders stream along the north side of Wairua Bay, boarding and launching their canoes. Many are stranded and start swimming. Ngāti Toa become exhausted from this intense killing spree. Te Reo Paraha lands his canoe and assesses the situation on shore. Ngāti Toa have considerable losses, but only a fraction of those suffered by the invaders. The women and children leave the pa and drag bodies back to shore. The feast tonight will be memorable. Powder, shot and ball are replenished. Cartouche pouches filled. Ngāti Toa now board their canoes and push out through the floating bodies and drifting canoes in pursuit of their prey. It has been a great morning. It promises to be a great day. The sun now bathes Kapiti in its glory. Okay, this episode really does need an epilogue. Now, my version comes from my imagination, but is based on what we have. All accounts agree that this was a stunning victory for Te Rao Paraha. The odds against him seem overwhelming. But you look at naval invasions over the centuries, they are always a difficult war manoeuvre to get right. They need practice and tight coordination. The multiple iwi and hapu would have made cohesion difficult for the invaders. Certainly, Ngāti Toa has the advantage there. 
the ability to coordinate precise times of rendezvousing almost an impossibility. The mechanics of landing a force of 2,000 whilst under attack, a huge unknown. Perhaps the overwhelming numbers of the invaders is actually detrimental. And of course, muskets almost certainly played a huge role. You have the feeling that if the old Taki fleet had gone down to Waikanae and they all left together with the fleet landing on the northern coast, then marching past the lagoon to attack Waiaroa, things might have turned out differently. But most times in life, you only get one chance. With defeat meaning a certain genocide, Te Rao Paraha and Ngāti Toa display extraordinary bravery and daring that results in a stunning victory. Certainly, this is one of their finest hours. In the aftermath, he captures many war canoes, critical for his designs on Waipunamu. In just a few months, a further migration from Taranaki and Mangatauturi will double his fighting force. After the Battle of Waioroa, Te Rao Paraha is now Lord and Master from Horofenawa to Whanganui Atara. And from there, he can see the South Island, Waiponamu. Well, folks, that brings us to the end of this episode. Give it a like if you enjoyed it and subscribe if this content interests you. Now, going forward, I may depart from my chronological sequence of battle. There are over 600 battles in Crosby's Musket Wars, and I've only covered about 30. So I may jump to some of the more interesting and strategically important ones. Also, I will be concentrating more on the upper half of the North Island where I'm able to visit with reasonable costs. Now, if there's anyone out there with a drone, especially in the lower half of the North Island and South Island, that would like to collaborate with me, then my email address is in the description below. Drop me a line. Okay then, thanks for joining me. Hey Connor, take it easy and I'll catch you next time.